Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our worship service. It's good to see you all here, brave in the cold. Uh, I was talking to William a little bit ago. He said the man hung on a tree for us. We could come to church in the cold for him. And amen. I don't know. I agree with that. Uh, I have a couple of announcements to cover uh, before we begin this morning. Uh, first, I'm sure you've heard about uh, Kenny Onroad's funeral arrangements uh, from the phone tree, but in case you haven't, uh, there's going to be a family night here on Wednesday from 5 to 7, followed by a service here Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, and then a graveside service at Augusta Memorial. So please uh, be here for that if you can. And speaking of prayers, please continue to lift up Anthony Johnson. Uh, Anthony is not going to be moved now. Uh, he's going to stay at uh, Augusta because the doctors have seen some uh, improvement, so that's good. The spirits are still good. Uh, that's a testimony to his faith, so, uh, but please uh, keep, keep him in your prayers. The men's group will be meeting tonight at 6.30. All men are invited to that. Our next deacon meeting is tomorrow night. If you're a deacon, please try to attend. And also mark your calendars for Wednesday, February 7th at 6.30. Uh, Gary Evers will be delivering a very powerful testimony about everything that he's been through over the last uh, couple of years. I asked uh, Gary to give a summary of that, and he said, I'm going to talk about how the devil got me and God saved me. <laughs> so God's, God's really done an amazing work in Gary uh, the past, past year or so, and God's still doing it. So please join us on February 7th uh, for that. And finally, today starts our Sanctity of Life observance. Uh, Della, do you have an announcement for that? And you'll see some baby bottles in the windows or some up here too, so please grab one before you leave today. Uh, Jessica, you have anything this morning? Um, no, for the first time, all the needs left in the corner have been met, so praise God for that. Um, we have youth group tonight from 5 to 6, so if you're available and like to come, please do. And our young adult for the week is Molly Coffey. It was her birthday on the 18th, so please show her some. And it's also apartment A, if you send her a, right? Yeah, so it says, it should say 18504 apartment A. 18504 apartment, apartment A. A. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, Sue, do you have anything for us? Uh, friend of the week is Anthony Johnson, so please remember him this week. We'll have our Tuesday at the table uh, this coming Tuesday at San Zones, beginning around 1130. If you'd like to enjoy some good fellowship and food, I um, invite you to come. Everyone's welcome. Uh, ladies Bible study is starting up soon. The books have been ordered. Um, information in your bulletin. This evening we'll resume our bell rehearsal and our worship ensemble rehearsal, um, 5.30 and 6.30 respectively. With that, our praise team will come and we'll uh, share a song called Welcome to God's, God's Morning.
As part of uh, this first Sunday of honoring the sanctity of life, we will pause for a moment to honor and quietly reflect upon those of our church family who passed into heaven in 2023. At the reading of each name, we will ring a handbell. Mike Williams saw the face of Christ on January 24th. Ronnie Chandler saw the face of Christ on February the 4th. Opal Goble saw the face of Christ on February 19th. Judy Fox saw the face of Christ on April 29th. Linwood Hutch Hutchins saw the face of Christ on May 11th. Billy Chandler saw the face of Christ on June 23rd. Ola Mae Coffey saw the face of Christ on June 26th. Bernie Angus saw the face of Christ on July 16th. Benny Eckert saw the face of Christ on July 21st. Roller Petey Evers saw the face of Christ on July 25th. Daniel Johnson saw the face of Christ on July 28th. And Jimmy Grant saw the face of Christ on December 19th. We will miss all of them, and we will cherish their memories, knowing that we will see them again, and that this world's loss of them is heaven's gate. Will you please enjoy this video meditation of the beautiful song, Scars in Heaven.
we have a precious, precious young lady who is going to come and sing about heaven. And she's going to remind us that heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace.
wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand as we sing together?
chilly night, so that we may come into your presence with our friends and our family and just raise our voices to praise you. Now, as we give back to you the gifts that you have given to us, use them that they may spread the gospel throughout the world. In Jesus' name, I pray.
my uh, grandfather on my mother's side uh, was an interesting kind of guy. He, he was a farmer, he was a, a preacher, he was an inventor, and for a time he was a missionary to what was then Eastern Europe. And growing up, I, I, I thought of him as kind of an Amish Indiana Jones. Uh, and one of those trips that he took when I was a kid was to Turkey. And I remember him coming home so excited to show me something that he found. Uh, and he took me into the little room that he used as a study, and he said that he brought back something special, something amazing that he'd gotten from this man in Turkey. And I was just a kid. So as he's pulling open one of his desk drawers, I'm thinking, Granddaddy done brought back a magic carpet. <laughs> or a magic lamp. Right? Instead, he pulls out a piece of wood, a hunk of wood, about half the size of my arm, and he holds it up like a trophy. And he said, do you know what this is? And I said, a piece of wood? And he smiled and he said, no, this is not just a piece of wood. This is a piece of Noah's Ark. Now, again, I'm just a little kid. But I was old enough to realize that a piece of wood from Noah's Ark would look a lot older than something that I just pulled off the willow tree in the backyard. I didn't, I didn't really think of my grandfather as Indiana Jones anymore after that day. But I did understand in a very simple way why he believed something that was just so obviously wrong. He just wanted to believe it so badly. Because Noah's Ark is one of those stories that just sink deep down inside of us. If you see this tapestry over here, this is from Diane. Diane is the Noah's Ark lady. This is her favorite story in the Bible, so she, she thought she'd bring some show and tell this morning. <laughs> But in fact, this might be the most well-known story in the entire Bible among people who aren't Christians. It's a story that rewrites history in a very sad way, a very violent way. It's an ancient story, among the most ancient in the world. And people have argued over whether this story in Genesis is true or not for hundreds of years. And like anything else in the very dim past, it can't be proven with absolute certainty. There's been evidence that's been argued over by scientists, but to me, the very best evidence of the flood, aside from the fact that it's in the Bible, is how many stories there are of it. There are over 500 flood stories in over 150 cultures on every continent, except Antarctica, of course, from Africa to Asia to Britain, Australia, South America, the American Indians, all of them have their own flood stories. And almost all of those stories have a lot in common with the story that we're going to read about today. All of them agree on the same point. At some time in history, maybe when all the people alive were concentrated in one small area of the planet, water almost ended humanity. Let's take a look at exactly what that was. And most importantly, let's look at why it had to happen. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. We are going to start out this morning with verses 5 through 8. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now skip down to verses 13 through 22. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, 
and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And this is God's word. A couple of weeks ago, if you remember, we talked about Adam and Eve bringing sin into the world. Only about 1,600 years have passed between Genesis 3 and Genesis 6. But already we see to what extent sin has spread. Evil has exploded right along with the world's population. And not long before, the world was pure and new and perfect. There was nothing but joy. But now everything is drowned in wickedness and misery. And all of this is happening under God's unblinking eyes. Verse 5 starts out by talking about the evil things people did, whether to themselves or to each other. But then it ends with what was behind those evil actions. It was their minds and their hearts. Every thought and intention was evil. And notice it was evil continually. It was always evil. It was only evil. There was no possibility for good anymore because there was no room for them for good. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Meaning what you hold in your heart, good or bad, is going to come out sooner or later in your words and your actions. That's why to God, it really doesn't matter that you manage to make it through a whole day acting calm by swallowing your anger. doesn't matter that you made it through a whole day smiling to cover up your bad attitude. It doesn't matter how hard you try to act. It only matters who you are in your heart because that is what is going to determine your actions. And in verse 5, we see that everyone's heart is spoiled. There's just darkness inside. So much that there's not even a desire anymore to do good. And that's why we have some of the saddest words in the whole Bible, right there in verse 6. And the Lord regretted that he had made men on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. <clears throat> just let those words sink in. How bad do things have to be for God to feel this way? We think things are bad now. We think, things are, we think people are terrible now. Our world is a paradise compared to what it is in Genesis chapter 6. Now, God's regret here is not like ours. We have regrets because we make mistakes, right? God does not make mistakes. The Hebrew word for regret there in verse 6 actually means to grieve. And the word grieve means to sigh. Have you ever been so heartbroken over something, so struck with grief, that you can't even speak? You try to reach down into all that sadness inside of you and, and bring something of it up, but all that you can manage is just this deep, soul-crushing sigh. That is God right here. He's heartbroken over the state of humanity because there's no hope for humanity. Not yet. As bad as things are in the world, this is also as good as it's going to get. Because it is only going to get worse. It's an amazing thing to read. And here's where we get to the heart of the story. When we think about the flood, we think about how much rain that must have been. Or the people caught up in those rising waters. We think about Noah's faithfulness, which we'll get to in a bit. But this story is focused only on one single thing. God's judgment. God will not put up with sin. He can't. And that is why God the creator now has no choice but to destroy. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry I have made them. Now pay attention to that phrase there, blot out. Your translation might have wipe out. The Hebrew meaning of that phrase is very specific, and it describes exactly what God means to do here. The focus is not on the thing being blotted out or wiped out. The focus is on what's being removed by that wiping. 
In other words, God's saying, I have to destroy what I've made because sin cannot be allowed to continue on like this. And something about that just seems to hit us the wrong way, doesn't it? I saw a post uh, this week on social media. Somebody, somebody had written, the Bible is 100% pro-life. And someone else, obviously not a Christian, had replied, yeah, except for that one time God killed everything and made a floating zoo. <laughs> There's a real anger over what God does here from people who don't understand who God is at all. God, the holy judge, is being judged by sinful people. And it's always been like that. What did Adam do when God confronted him over eating that fruit? He blamed Eve, didn't he? And then he went even further and he said, this, this woman did it. And you made her God, so you can't be too mad because this is all kind of your fault. <laughs> but it didn't take Adam long to realize that his sin could not be lessened by blaming God. Just like our sin can't be lessened by calling God unjust by sending this flood. But still we look at verse 7 and we think, well, okay, I can, I can see the evil people being destroyed. That, that makes sense. But the animals? And, and the birds? That's a big problem with modern society now, by the way. Animals and birds and fish are precious in God's sight. Amen. And it is our job to take care of them. But too often, animals are regarded now as more special than people are. Yeah. But here it is. Sanctity of Life Sunday, right? And we're talking about God killing people. We're talking about God killing children. Killing babies. Because surely there are a lot of them at this time. But that's how sin infects everything. The world's people were beyond repentance. Think of the earth as a body, okay? God created us, humanity, as the head of that body. But if that head gets cut off, gets cut off the body dies, doesn't it? That's what happens to the animals here. And we all know the effects of sin go way past the people who are being intentionally evil. And it's the innocent who often pay the steepest price. We have a lot of people in this church involved in public education, and God bless every one of you, too. How many children do you know, just in this town, who are suffering because of the sins of the parents? Drug use, neglect, abuse. God does not bring this flood upon humanity. Let's make that very clear. Humanity brings the flood upon itself, and humanity brings it onto their own children. And if anybody still thinks God's wrong in the way that he's going to bring about this judgment, look at what he says in verse 7. I will blot out man whom I have created. There's an issue of ownership here, isn't it? God's saying that all these people in the world, all this wickedness is ultimately his to deal with because he's the one who created it all. That same idea is stated directly in Psalm 24, 1. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. This is a hard lesson for us to learn, but it's the key to understanding this whole story. And it's also the key to understanding both your happiness in life and fulfilling God's good and perfect will for you. So you ready? Here comes. All those things you think you own, you don't. You don't own your family. You don't own your house. You don't own your health or your job or your plans. None of that is yours. It is all God's. It all comes from him. It's all sustained by him. And at some point, it's all going to return to him. And so that means that God owns it all. And if God owns it, that means God can do anything he wants with it, including taking it away. But with that in mind, remember who God is. He is the holy judge of creation, but he is also full of mercy and love. Amen. Even in judgment, God will always offer hope. And the hope that God offers here comes in verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. No matter how, how dark this world gets, God will always place a little bit of his light in it. That is Noah. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And if you want to know how he did that, by the way, that's laid out in verse 9. 
Noah was righteous. He always did what was right instead of what's easy. Noah was blameless. He followed God's word completely. And Noah walked with God. He made knowing and worshiping his creator the most important and constant thing in his life. That's how you find God's favor. That's Noah. And because Noah found favor in God's eyes, God does something to Noah in verse 13 that he didn't do with any other person in the world at that time. God speaks to him. But what God says is tragic. He tells Noah, I'm going to make an end of all flesh because, and watch this, the earth is filled with violence through them. The sin of the human heart has ruined everything. And so God has to destroy everything. God's going to bring a flood because earth needs to be washed clean. But he's going to save Noah and his family. In verses 14 through 16, God lays out exactly how he's going to do that. <laughs> Noah's going to build an ark. Now it's telling that, that there are so few facts in this story about all the stuff that we really want to know about. Where did Noah live? You know, Who are the people around him? Who's ruling that area? What, what, what's everybody going to do once the heavens open and the deep opens? There's nothing about that here. There's nothing about the things that we're so curious to know. But there is an extraordinary amount of detail about what this ark is supposed to be built from and look like. God gives Noah instructions on what kind of wood to use and how to bind that wood together, and how to arrange the inside of the ark, and how to make the roof and the door, and all of that is included in verses 14 through 16, while all the other stuff is left out. And it's for one reason. God is showing us right here how a right relationship with him works. God arranges the plan. We carry out the plan. God says, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do, but you actually have to do it. God is the architect of the ark. Noah is the builder. And none of that is going to get done unless they both do what they're supposed to do. The ark that Noah has to build to house these animals and birds and creeping things, it's big. It's 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits tall. That translates to about 450 feet long. 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. We're going to talk about building something that big in a minute, but let's just set that aside for now and talk about what God's calling you to do. There are times in your life when God will say, I have a purpose for you that goes beyond anything you might expect. I have a plan, and out of my goodness and love, I am making you a part of that plan. My only question is, are you willing to do it, or are you too scared? Noah is willing. And he's willing because of what we already saw in, in verse 9. He's righteous, he's blameless, and he walks with God. Noah has put himself into a position to be used by God because he's put the work into his spiritual life. But three things have to happen in order for Noah to accomplish this huge, this huge task that God has for him. And those are the same three things, by the way, that have to happen in your life to accomplish what God has for you. And here is the first one. You have to abandon yourself to God. There is no indication that God had ever spoken to Noah at all until this moment. God speaks, and that has to be the first shock that Noah felt. The second one comes with what God says. He says, make yourself an ark. Now, notice that God doesn't say why. God just said he's going to destroy all flesh. There's no mention of a flood. There's no mention of filling the ark with animals. The only details that God gives Noah right away is how big this ark has to be. Noah does not have all the information. He doesn't even have most of the information. A part of Noah, as righteous and blameless as he is, has to be thinking, this is nuts. <laughs> Right? It's not crazy because he has to build this huge boat. It's crazy he has to build a boat at all. And we don't know where Noah's living, but it's likely nowhere near the sea. There's even a question among theologians as to whether it has ever rained before here in Genesis chapter 6. 
And even if it has, how can it possibly rain so much that Noah's going to need a boat? <laughs> Nothing of what God is telling Noah to do makes sense. But here's the important thing. To Noah, it doesn't matter if it makes sense. Because God is saying it. Doesn't matter that Noah thinks it's crazy. Doesn't matter that Noah thinks it's impossible. Doesn't matter that Noah can't see the whole picture because Noah knows that God sees the whole picture. And Noah knows that God's going to keep him and his family safe. And if you want to be safe, you have to do the exact same thing. God says you have to believe in me, not what you think is possible. You have to listen to me, not your doubts. You have to rely on me, not your own strength. And you have to surrender to me because that is the only way you're going to make it. But that surrender to God, abandoning every doubt and worry and fear and holding on to him is so hard to do. Which is why you need a second thing in order to succeed. For Noah to do this, there has to be self-sacrifice. God is not going to build this ark for Noah. He is not going to have an angel float this ark down from heaven all made up and built and just set it on Noah's front door for his family to move right into. If Noah is going to be kept safe in an ark while everybody else in the world perishes, then Noah has to build it. Everything else in his life has to come second now. There is no time to rest because those clouds are gathering. There is no time to put off building that ark to tomorrow. Because when, what Noah does today matters more than he could ever realize. He has to get to work. His sons have to get to work. There is no time to waste. And it is the same for your life. Your life on this earth is a blink of the eye. Every moment is precious. How are you spending those moments? Are you wasting them by doing things that don't count toward eternity? Are you sitting with your phone or your tablet looking at everybody else's life instead of looking at your own? Are you paying more attention to how bad the news says the world is? Or are you out there trying to make the world better? If you think you can sit around and wait for God to do everything for you, then you need to read this story every day until the truth sinks in. If you think you've done your part for God, you've put in your years of work, and now you can just retire and sit on the porch all day, you need to remember that when Noah chopped down that first tree and drove that first nail into what became what would become the ark, he was 500 years old. So what's your excuse? <laughs> as long as you have breath in you, God has a purpose for you. There is a reason you're still here. God has a will for you. Accomplishing that will is going to take hard work. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take going without a lot of things that other people have. And that's on purpose. Because nothing that's worth something ever comes cheap. That is especially true with God. To do what God says you, you have to do, you're going to have to go against the flow. And that brings us to the third thing that both Noah and you are going to need here. And that is courage. How long does it take to build an ark like this? We can assume it's only Noah and his family working on this ark. Uh, biblical scholars say it could be 100 years based on Noah's age when he started the ark and then when God commanded him to go into the ark. Others look at verse 3 and they say it took Noah 120 years. Either way, it is a long time. <laughs> How many sunny days under cloudless skies did Noah work on that ark? Days when he would stop and he would wipe the sweat off his brow and look up and he'd think, rain, yeah, it doesn't look like rain. <laughs> How long did it take for the people around Noah to hear about what he was doing and come and watch and make fun of him? Calling him crazy, calling him foolish, calling him childish. How lonely do you think Noah felt? And I'm not talking about while he was just building the ark. I'm talking about his entire life. Verse 8 says that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It doesn't say that his sons did. It doesn't even say that his wife did. It's just him. Imagine being the only person out there trying to do good. Wanting to do good. The only person who looked to God rather than himself. Who worshipped God rather than himself. A lot of us in here feel that loneliness sometimes too, don't we? 
For some of us, we are the only committed practicing Christians in our entire families. Yes. Or we're the only committed practicing Christians at work. Or we're the only committed practicing Christians among our friends. Think of the pressure you feel to cling to your faith and to do what God wants when everybody around you doesn't even think about lives and doesn't even think about God and their lives seem to be going just fine. What these people must have said to Noah is a lot like what we hear all the time. Wait, you believe in what? You, you believe in God? There's no God. Oh, come on, you're too smart to be religious. You're living a delusion. Noah didn't just hear that for a hundred years or more while he was building this ark. He'd been hearing that his whole life. But he kept his courage. He kept his faith. Board after board, nail after nail, he never stopped believing. In 2 Peter 2.5, Peter calls Noah a herald of righteousness. While all these other people mocked what he was doing, Noah preached. He tried to turn their hearts even while board after board and nail after nail. The people around him refused to believe until that water came. Until not only the skies opened, but all the foundations of the great deep burst forth. It didn't just rain down, it rained up. The door on the ark was shut. It didn't matter how much the people pounded. It didn't matter how much they screamed or begged. People think God's too harsh in what he does here. I say God waited 1,600 years before he pronounced his judgment. And then he waited 100 years more while Noah built the ark. And then he gave Noah the words to try to turn the people back. But in the end, it was their choice. We think of that ark alone floating on those dark waters. An ark shaped like a coffin, by the way, which is exactly what it was. Noah entered that coffin and he became dead to the old world. He came out into a new world to be the father of a new people. People today, they still search for the remains of Noah's ark, just like my grandfather did. Because it's such a powerful symbol of God. It's a memorial of God's goodness. It's a testimony to human faith. It's a symbol of divine mercy. It's a sign of God's wrath against sin. But listen to me. You don't have to do what my grandfather did and go all the way to Turkey and climb your way up Mount Ararat to look for God's ark. In fact, you don't have to go anywhere. Do you want to see God's ark? Do you want to see the place that keeps you safe from the storms, the place where you can come in dead and leave alive? Look at these four walls. You don't have to go looking for God's ark. You are sitting in one. People say, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Don't need it. I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. I'm just too busy. I'm exhausted. I've got places i got to go. And besides, I can just watch church on the internet or on the TV. It's the same thing, after all, right? No. But it's not. Because if church isn't a regular part of your life, you're stuck out there in the world under skies that are growing a little darker every day. God said to Noah, I'm going to keep you and your family safe by putting you in a place where you can ride out your storms. A place where I'll hold you in my hands and keep you fed and keep you nourished. Because out there in the world, you're not going to find any nourishment at all. I'll make a place in this broken, crooked world that's going to be a memorial of my goodness. A place that's going to be a testimony to your own faith. It'll be a symbol of my mercy, but it will also point to a judgment for those who don't believe. Yeah. And God said the same to you. In this age, we're all Noah. We're all called to be righteous and blameless and to walk with our God. And we're all called to do the good work that God's given us for his glory and his sake. Not our own and certainly not for the praises and acceptance of others. Because ours is a higher calling. Ours is an eternal home. One that God says you need to start building right now in this world. One board and one nail at a time. And if you're ready to get to work, I invite you up here as we sing our closing hymn. Let's pray. Father, how wonderful it is that you've invited each of us into your work in this world to give us each a purpose to fill every life here with meaning in spite of the hardships we face and the limitations that we place upon ourselves. It can be a lonely thing to live for you in a world of people who live only for themselves. And yet you've given us yourself. 
You've given us one another. You've given us this church as holy arks to keep us safe and nourished. How wonderful it is to be blessed so abundantly. We praise you and we ask your wisdom to shine through in every part of our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing the church's one foundation. Thank you.